Our last panel before we, we break for lunch is also, uh, I think, a very uh, certain relevant topic, uh, one that certainly brings together uh, knowledge, research, uh, actionability, and, and a case study, I think, that will, uh, will give people an idea that many of these problems are solvable. And we're doing it all in the context of uh, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, which, as many have called, uh, especially in the media, a wake-up call for America. So on this panel um, today, we have assembled Tom Rooney, who is um, right here on my left, uh, a seasoned executive that's run multiple uh, water companies, energy companies, construction companies, uh, certainly very knowledgeable uh, and has seen a lot in terms of, of the corporate world and in terms of solutions that have actually worked in many of these sectors. We have uh, John Regas, the founder and CEO and chairman of, of Science Capital and Science Water, which is the largest dedicated US water infrastructure fund. And we have uh, Josiah Cox, all the way on the end, who is the founder and CEO of Central States uh, Water Resources, which is one of the fastest growing investor-owned utilities uh, in the US, somebody who's very committed to the Midwest and uh, the 10, 12 states that he currently operates in, but somebody who's on the ground uh, seeing a lot of this stuff and, and hopefully through the case study and, and the explanations that you're here today, uh, everyone will walk away with some more knowledge uh, and also the fact that many of these problems can be solved uh, in the context of Jackson. But with that, I'll, I'll pass it off to, uh, to Tom. Thank you, Alex. We, the three of us decided we can't sit down. Too much, Too much to talk about. So I'm Tom Rooney. Um, I've had the good fortune of being in the water space for 20 years now. Uh, and I've had the good fortune of running global corporations, either as CEO or chairman of the board. Um, and I have to tell you, I, I've given speeches on three or four continents about water going back 20 years. And it's in some ways like Groundhog Day, right? The same messages keep coming around and around. But today's discussion is really about a wake up call, a moment in time for the water sector uh, because of, of that which the world, is the world is learning from Jackson, Mississippi. I, I do want to preface my comments by saying some of my comments may appear to be picking on Jackson or picking on the mayor of Jackson uh, or the governor or the EPA. Uh, the truth is I'll pick on everybody. Uh, be, and what you'll find from the conversation is uh, it, there's a holistic challenge in the water space. And, and if you, if you you have to see it from all of the perspectives, and everyone has to claim responsibility, including we, the buyers of water, in terms of how we get from where we are today to where we need to be. And if we don't accept the fact that regulators and politicians and policymakers and, and uh, consumers and utility operators have to see the water challenge for what it is, it will be Groundhog Day for somebody at the microphone 20 years from today. And I really don't want to see that happen. So I'd rather ruffle feathers and inform uh, than avoid the issues. So, the agenda, and, and I'll talk about, is what you see on TV and what you need to know. Uh, John Regas will, will dive into the role of the private sector. And then Josiah Cox, who actually is the CEO in the first company that we acquired, and actually is one of the brightest success stories in changing places like, uh, like uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and then really the conclusion is, this is a national call to action. Okay, so what you see on TV, and I, I presume that most everybody has seen what uh, happened with Jackson, Mississippi, at least by virtue of what was on the news. You know, you see in the upper left-hand corner, the first media uh, was starting to show that there was a, a major rain in Jackson, Mississippi for weeks on end, uh, caused the Pearl River to overflow its banks very high. Uh, which affected the OB Curtis water treatment facility, and in doing so, knocked out some pumps and they, and they catastrophically lost the water. You see the mayor getting at the podium, uh, pleading for help, that the problem is so big and so persistent. You see bottled water, I think everybody saw that on, on television. What's interesting is, there actually wasn't running water at the time because the running water had stopped, but the truth was, if you go back a month before, in, in the last day of July, they actually lost, they actually uh, had to go into a boil water order because for a brief period of time they lost water, even before the rains took place. And so Jackson was in a boil water uh, situation even before the big prolific rains took place. Then of course they had to bring in the uh, National Guard because the issue got to be so challenging. 
and then and then after a little bit of political squabbling, which is not is a bit natural, you've got the mayor on the right, you've got the governor in the center, and you've got the head of the EPA all at the microphone saying we've got to fix this thing, right? And then by the end of uh, August, even the president had uh, declared it a national emergency, and FEMA was brought in, right? And I believe his statement was that Flint, Michigan, and this is the president, something to the effect that the Flint, Michigan and uh, Jackson, Mississippi are simply things that can never happen again. And, and regrettably, I, I can say that, and unfortunately, I do think it's going to happen again because of what we're gonna talk about today and in places other than Jackson. So when I say we've really come at this from all different uh, sides, it's really the water problem that faces the United States and in large measure faces the world. Uh, and, I've, and I've had the good fortune of, of, being, of dealing with world leaders uh, on water issues going over the last 20 years. The problems that we have in the United States are mirrored in almost every country around the world. But there are problems and that's what we're gonna talk about. But you have to look at the infrastructure. I'll, I'll laughingly call it the pipes and the pumps. Uh, you have to look at the economics of water and you have to look at pu public policy. And if you don't engage the problem from all three dimensions, you simply cannot get to the finish line. So the first and, the, uh, the first and most obvious is the infrastructure, and we're back to looking at pumps and pipes. And so Jackson has, and, and underlying almost all water uh, utilities and water infrastructure, the most expensive component is the component you can't see. It's the water pipes that deliver water to you, and it's the sewer pipes that take the the sewer from your, your, uh, your home to where it's treated. The most expensive component is the component you can't see, and for that reason it goes, it goes unseen. But what happens with water pipes is you get water pipe bursts. Sometimes you have slow, mo or lots of times you have slow motion leaks, and you get the non-revenue, but you do get the bursts, people see that. Then you'll see the crew digging up your uh, streets. If it's sewage, you'll have, you'll have sanitary sewer overflows where sewage plants can't handle uh, effectively what becomes uh, rain. So when a sewer pipe degrades, it suddenly starts to become a drain for rain. So a sewer pipe, when it doesn't actually leak sewage out and create a problem, it wouldn't be much of a problem, it collects rainwater. Well, that's, that sounds like it's not a big deal, but the rainwater then inundates the water treatment plant and you get things like that. That's actually uh, Jackson with sewage, raw sewage in people's front yards. And then of course you've got big expensive plants and you've got pump above ground and that's what people normally look at. But it's really all three of those components in addition to the dams and everything else we talk about. What you don't see that's wrong with infrastructure is inadequate operations and maintenance. The EPA has been chiding Jackson for not having enough class A operators. There's the silver tsunami, like where are all these people gonna come from? They're not qualified to do so, we don't have the budget. But at the end of the day, many municipalities and many water utilities around the world simply don't have the right operators doing the right operations and maintenance. You've heard non-revenue water. It's, it's characterized in Jackson as 50%. But of that 50%, 20 to 30% of the people just don't pay bills because they either don't have a meter or they literally just won't pay their bills. And the, and the political leaders there don't have the, uh, the impetus to force people to pay their bills. You have deferred maintenance. This is the big thing, right, which is if you take all of the pent-up non-spending in operations and maintenance, Jackson's been characterized as having somewhere between one billion and two billion of deferred maintenance. So if you don't fix a pipe or a pump on time and it gets worse, you, you have a liability that's growing. And then unreported violations. So as bad as it looks in Jacksonville or any other community around the United States, typically, there, uh, there's gross underreporting, and in fact, the EPA has chided uh, Jackson for a lack of self-reporting, which by the way, the vast majority of all reporting of, of uh, EPA violations are self-reported. And so, if you're not particularly good at operations and maintenance, what's the odds that you can actually self-report accurately? Pretty scary. So second, and, and a lot of what I just said you've heard before, but let's talk about economics. This is something that, I think we all need to kind of get a, get a grasp on, which is if you start on the bottom, water rates don't cover operating costs. Most political leaders aren't willing to charge what water should cost to cover operating costs, let alone operations, maintenance, and sinking funds for long-term degradation. What happens is if you don't cover the operating costs, then you're not covering maintenance. And if you're not covering maintenance at the proper level, you have what's called deferred maintenance. 
So if I don't fix this pipe today, it gets a little bit worse tomorrow, but the, the, and it becomes a spiral. If you don't take care of the operating costs today and the maintenance today, then your operating costs actually go up. And then you go back to the first, which is okay, our operating costs aren't covered and our water rates have stayed the same and it's this vicious circle. So what ends up happening and what's happened at most water utilities around the United States and around the world is this deferred maintenance is a gigantic liability. It's infrastructure that is so badly degraded over time that what we get is a massive unfunded liability. And a little bit of a play on 10 years ago when we talked about banks that were too big to fail, the water sector has now become too big to fix, right? And so the numbers are so staggering as to what you would have to fix that public utility executives, politicians, regulators, and even the EPA acknowledges we can't force Jackson to pony up $1 billion or $2 billion to get ahead of it, so they sort of snip away at little tiny fixes to get compliant again, which is to say little tiny repairs, little tiny fixes, little tiny band-aids. But putting little tiny band-aids doesn't stop this vortex from happening where the systems just keep getting worse and worse and the liability keeps growing. So this is the economics uh, challenge. What are the economics challenges we have? Well, I started off by saying we don't charge the right rates. And there was discussion in the earlier panel about rates going up and whatnot, so let's talk about it. The, uh, we, the, in, the, in the United States and in the world, we don't really understand the value of water. I can guarantee you the people of Jackson, Mississippi today understand the value of water because you understand it when you don't have it. But absent that, you look at bottled water, roughly $5 a gallon. Look at tap water, it's less than a penny a gallon, right? Yet people go out and buy bottled water all the time. The average water and sewer bill in the United States is $110 a month. Some, pay, some places have one bill, some places have two bills that, that combine. That's, a, that's a, a, a fairly accurate but rough number. The average water and sewer bill in Jackson, which has this massive deferred maintenance problem, was $54 10 months ago per month, only raised to 64, and it, got, it had barely got there with a four to three split city council vote. In other words, they barely got themselves to $64 a month. Again, I'm not trying to pick on Jackson, but only use it as representative of how decisions are made. And so that was a 20% price increase 10 months ago, but $64 a month is still not even at the 110 level. And yet people are upset at how much they have to pay for water. We, we heard in the earlier panel, there's a lot of discussion about how water rates are going up and whatnot. The truth is the average cable bill, which today includes streaming and you know, your digital phone and whatnot, is about $200 a month. And I can tell you, uh, my kids love streaming and whatnot, but I don't think any of them are gonna get sick or hurt if Netflix goes out. But how many people are gonna be sickened in Jackson? And so it was, a, it was a heavy lift to go from 54 to $64 a month, and yet, Maslow's hierarchy of needs would suggest it's, the most, it's one of the most important things we have. Risk, reward, and irrational decision making. Because we don't value water correctly, and because regulations and regulators don't come down hard enough, so you have lax EPA enforcement. And by the way, I'm not criticizing the EPA. There's not the political will, and there's not enough funding from Congress for EPA to truly go after and enforce regulations. I'm not finding fault with the EPA, I'm simply saying that we Americans have to demand that the EPA have the, the, um, the imperative to do it and the money to do it. We have non-existent DOJ uh, prosecution. I will say this, seven or so years after Flint, Michigan, there were eight indictments that came out, including the governor. That's the first time I've ever heard of anybody uh, criminally prosecuted for not taking care of one of the most precious resources in the United States. I think at the, at the uh, far reaches of, of regulatory enforcement, there actually should be criminal charges on occasion. I'm not saying in Jackson, I'm not saying in Mississippi, I'm saying that's an element. Because if you don't have that, what you have is risk taking without consequences. And I don't care if you're a government official or a private sector, if there aren't consequences to bad decision making, then you should expect irrational decision making, and that's what's going on. That's going on around the world. And then the externalities are not recognized, the human health costs. Human health costs are huge. 
I think studies 10 years from now, if we look back, are going to show that in Jackson, Mississippi, a whole lot of people who have been sickened, right? We certainly know that from Flint, Michigan. Home values depressed, that's an absolute. I mean, anybody here willing to buy a home in Jackson right now or Flint? And Josiah will talk where we're in, a, in some cir circumstances where we've renovated water systems. You can actually prove their home values shot up. And they shot up at a time when rates went up. So the sensitivity of home values has nothing to do with water rates. It has everything to do with the ability to get water. And then economic uh, development is impaired. Right now, the one thing that Jackson, Mississippi could use more than anything is to have big industrial corporations move in, Google build something there. What do you think the odds of that are, right? Public policy. So water doesn't get votes. That's at the end of, that's, I've had world leaders in 30 countries tell me the same thing. I've, I've sat across the table with mayors in major cities in the United States, and they, they would start to lecture me like, Tom, I don't think there's been a politician, uh, you know, in 2,000 years ever get one vote for spending one dollar on water. And I know a lot of people that lost votes for, for spending money in water. That, at the end of the day, has to change. If I could ask President uh, Joe Biden to do one thing, it would be to use the bully pulpit and change the dynamic. And change the dynamic that water is valuable, and we do need to value it, and that the money can be spent in the right ways. But we have to change the narrative that water doesn't get votes. Uh, refuse to charge the true cross of water. I talked about that. Lack of regulatory enforcement. Lack of financial accounting for liabilities. I can tell you that many, many cities, so I used to run the, the world's largest firm in repairing, uh, repairing water pipes and sewer pipes. And we had a technology where we could survey using robotics and show you the exact state of affairs of all your water and sewer pipes. They demanded that we not do it even if we would do it for free. Why? Better that they not know how bad they are, because if you do, it actually becomes a liability on your books. Jackson, Mississippi is junk bond status, because the world has come to understand that their infrastructure is not an asset, it's a liability. So if we had better GASB, which is financial accounting for government, if we had stronger GASB accounting, those liabilities on the book would cause a lot of water utilities and, and municipalities to wake up because you can't afford to have junk bond status in every city in America because you have a massive liability sitting on your books. That alone would be a wake-up call for a lot of utilities or a lot of cities. Obviously, we see a lot of finger pointing, federal, state, and local. It's not my problem. It's his or it's hers. Uh, the real issue is nobody wants to deal with that typhoon or that, that thing spinning out of control. You get Democrats versus Republicans, you get big cities versus the rural, and of course you see fi uh, racial finger pointing, right? And it, are all of those, are some or all of those aspects true? Sure they are. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi is 80% is minority. The truth is it's an economically disadvantaged community, and so that, that spiraling cost, deferred maintenance, is most, most pertinent there, and they have the least ability to take care of it, so that little bit of of working around the fringes to sort of band-aid it. They simply didn't have the economics to do that. Is there a racial imperative? I don't want to go there. All I can say is that that is the community that's going to get hurt the, the earliest. And finally, in transitioning, because we are science, I'm with science and we are private equity, we, we'd like to think that we can bring really smart commercial acumen to bear. Uh, but one of the frustrating things for me is this irrational aversion to the private sector. This is a literal recent quote from the mayor in Jackson. Uh, he's referring to privatization. He says, that is an absolute death sentence for cities. You lose control of the water. You lose control of the city, point blank. Now, if I was a comedian, I'd say, well, how's that been working out for you, right? So the point is, there's a time and a place to bring commercial smarts and privatization. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Regas. John is the chairman of, of science. And he'll talk through how we've been uh, how we've been trying to be part of the solution. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to bring you over a different perspective on um, water, which um, is going to be the perspective of um, let me make this. 
uh, the perspective of uh, someone who until eight years ago was in fact um, and not a water person. Many of you here have an interest in water. I didn't know anything about water eight years ago. Uh, what, I, what I knew is what do we do, which is um, we've been founded in 1994. We are a private equity firm. I was the founder of the company. Uh, we, in fact, invest uh, in turnarounds and workouts. We like to, to fix things, which is in our nature. And um, in 2007, uh, we started investing in, in real assets, many different industries, which gives us a lot of experience and a lot of um, uh, reference points to be able to, to analyze industries and, uh, and opportunities. And um, we started looking at the water sector in 2014. And this is my objective here, to give you what we saw as a private, equ as a private equity investor in the water sector uh, and not what the water sector, the, the way the water sector sees themselves. Uh, in this respect, I think it was Carlos who said in the prior panel that uh, one of his aspirations for the next five years is to bring more people into the water sector. They very much are needed. Uh, there is a huge gap, and I will show you where the gap is. And uh, we are the classic group that should be brought into the water sector. Um, a cheery fact here that uh, it was all random. Uh, there's an individual s sitting in front of me who came into my office uh, eight years ago, and it was the weekend before Memorial Day, and he said, um, here's a 500-page report on water. Um, it looks interesting. Uh, why don't you read it over the weekend? And I said, okay, thank you very much, Alex. So that was the random event that brought us here. Um, <clears throat> okay, the first thing you learn when you come into the water sector, it's all about sensational headlines. It's the obvious, I won't reside on this, but um, the United Nations has already identified that this is the biggest problem in the world. They have diagnosed the problem and so on and so forth. We know all that. Uh, the second thing is, uh, oh, the River Rhine is no longer a river. Uh, wonderful. Here's the BBC reporting. Um, the third thing is, you learn that a lot of wars are fought about water. So it's getting better as we speak. A wonderful industry. Okay, this is the example of Ethiopia and Egypt over the dam because uh, there's no rules who controls the water. Um, and of course, there is uh, <clears throat> the Wall Street Journal with Jackson. We're going to be talking a lot about that. Uh, the second thing that you learn is that, um, oh, here's the cheery, uh, the, 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 the cheery fact of the, of the page is that uh, this is just scratching the surface. I think this is obvious to everybody. Um, the second thing that you learn in this um, industry is that it is, in fact, a huge industry, okay? Um, in the United States alone, it's a 100 billion estimate. Uh, we'll talk about the quality of the data and the statistics. 320 million people served. Um, I'm gonna focus on the hydro commerce cycle, which is taking the water from the water table, treating it for use, using it, storing it if it need be, and then treating it again for the return to the environment. That's the cycle that goes round and round, okay? Uh, some statistics. Uh, 68,000 utilities, I beg to differ with, with Seth, our good friend. Um, our, our analysis of the industry, contrary to what you might hear about from consulting firms, the government, ta -ta 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 -ta, all the other different sources, um, there are 68,000 utilities. We think actually there are 75,000 utilities. The answer is nobody knows. Um, second thing is, uh, another little <coughs> factoid there, uh, the hundreds of millions of miles okay, that you have of pipe, which uh, interestingly, once you put in the ground, everybody forgets about, and there'll be an interesting comment about that in a second, okay, 54,000 municipalities that run their water systems, um, okay, another small number to deal with, and, and then of course, <clears throat> those municipalities, 50, 50 to 60% of their balance sheet is the water system, okay, and therefore the comment that Tom made a little earlier, um, okay, Another comment by a mayor that a mayor might make is that, you know what, I'm looking at my city, what do we need? I'll, been, I'll build a kindergarten um, rather than a, a pipe because the pipe is underneath the ground. I can't put my name on it. Uh, if, I put a, um, if I put it on the kindergarten, I can put my name on it. So there's a lot of nuance in this industry in addition to being huge, okay? It's very complex in a number of ways. Second thing that you learn is that it is broken. I don't want to beat a dead horse. Uh, everybody's been talking about this today, but some little highlights. Uh, number one, 30% of all systems are non-compliant. That's interesting. I thought we lived in a, 
first world uh, country. 3% uh, are serious violators. Serious violators means boil orders and uh, gray water coming into your home, et cetera, et cetera. That's fun. Um, okay, some examples of cities that have uh, <clears throat> lead pipes. Uh, we all know what uh, the consequences of lead pipes are, uh, and they are everywhere. And then uh, the EPA um, 400 billion estimate to fix US water infrastructure, uh, that's not correct not because the EPA doesn't know, but because the numbers are all over the place, the definitions are all over the place, what are we fixing, which part, et cetera, et cetera. The end result of all this is that um, we get a D and a D plus rating for water consistently. This was in 2017. Uh, the results for 2021 have just come out. They are the same, zero improvement. Uh, okay, the cheery fact here is that um, you may not know this, but the Philadelphia water systems still have pipes from, that are wooden from the Civil War, okay, which is exciting. Um, and they, they lose 30% of the water, but they were really nice to us. They actually invested in our fund, so I have nothing bad to say about Philadelphia. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, the, the third thing that you learn is the fragmentation. The fragmentation in this industry, it's horrible. It's multi-layered. I, I, I won't make a big speech on fragmentation alone, but here's one statistic. So <clears throat> this is something that we've developed initially. So you see in Ireland, there is um, one system with 4.854 million um, connections. Okay? In Greece, there are three systems with 3.5 million connections. In the United States, at the bottom, we have 60, this is the 68,000 number with 5,000 connections. Okay? So hello, 5,000 connections. So you can imagine here, okay, what the level of expertise, managerial capability, um, scale in terms of accessing resources of all types, purchasing, capital resources, et cetera, et cetera. Where is all that within a, in a, in, in the average system is 5,000 people. Okay. Um, the cheery fact is that the uh, fragmentation is actually multi-layered. It's by core competence. It's uh, geographical because you cannot move water over distances. It's regulatory and it's legal because you have different, actually laws in different states and so on and so forth. So very, very complex situation. Um, now, okay, the next slide is the findings. This is a bit complex, but it's worthwhile. I'll go through it fairly quickly. Okay, um, the cons, and there are many of them. Okay, uh, fragmentation. Lack of research and reliable data, okay, arcane law systems. There is no national regulator, which is one of the biggest um, differences with foreign countries. Uh, there are many other regulators, okay, poor practices, environmental considerations, geographical considerations, local considerations, etc. Very high emotions because this is considered the water is considered the social good. Uh, the inefficiency is monumental, to say the least. 30% of all utility water lost. This was mentioned before earlier. And a multitude of small companies that actually turn away institutional capital. And as private equity, our job is to organize institutional capital and bring it to the industry. Okay, what are the pros? Because obviously, we stayed with it. Uh, long life of assets. This is extremely attractive. Durability and longevity of cash flows. This is extremely attractive. And the industry, looking at it from the eyes of, with the eyes of, of, a, of an investor, is uncorrelated to all other financial investments because people will pay their water bills because they need to pay their water bills. So the cash flows are steady and are there. And finally, there is a huge positive impact on the environment, community, country, health, uh, economy, etc. So uh, when you look at the pros and the pros, or the, the, the pros and the pros, we decided that notwithstanding the very, very many obstacles that we have an opportunity here and the opportunity is that there are many problems to solve and um, when there are many problems to solve some heroes emerge and then to organize the industry because the biggest thing that this industry lacks is organization all right cheery facts um, we also have to make a profit doing it uh, because we are investors okay how do you do it uh, we have you have to do your own work uh, as you can probably have probably gathered here Everybody has an opinion, everybody has a statistic, everybody has everything. Okay, so we decided to do our own work. That means, which for us is very difficult because private equity relies on other people to do the work, is primary research, okay? 
Um, there, there are no ready ideas. You got to create your own ideas. Most of the financial institutions are debating what ESG means. That's all useless to us here. Okay. Uh, the work has to be done in the weeds. It's not desktop. So if you expect to put your suit on and come to the office every day, don't because the water industry doesn't work that way. Okay. Um, it's a real engagement in the field and you have to engage in the industry. There are no shortcuts in this industry. It's hard work. Okay. It took us eight years, okay, which is a very long time for a private equity uh, en entry into a new industry. Um, uh, we dropped everything else to do it. Okay? We had to bet the firm because we didn't have the resources to do everything else that we were doing, which we had many funds in many industries, and also do water. So we decided to uh, de-emphasize everything else, stick with water. Um, okay, the reward does that we had proprietary insights that lead to proprietary investment opportunities, which is great. Okay, the second thing is a lot of people are talking about we have to solve it. Okay, I have to, <laughs> to tell you, Solve one problem, okay? Don't, don't, there's, no, there's no Google solution in, this, in the water sector because the water sector is based, is very localized, very geographically driven, and you have to solve one problem. You have to focus on solving one problem, otherwise you get lost. The second thing is find a company that in solving that problem makes money because if you're gonna be in business in the water sector, you can't do it with subsidies. There are no subsidies. So it has to be make money doing it. Take the high road and do it for the long term because there's community considerations, social considerations, and it has to be done that way. Okay. Now, for example, in the, in the case study of, of CSWR, and Josiah is going to go over in detail on that, um, we were doing the work for 18 months organizing the investment okay, and, and getting prepared before we put a dollar up. Okay. That's the amount of commitment that you have to have. Okay. Now, the cheery fact here is that you will know you're doing the, the, the work correctly if you're out in the field and you're visiting a, a small water utility and the, and the CEO who is dressed in camo uh, clothing brings you to the office, the utility office, which happens to be the gun shed. All right. Um, second thing, uh, private equity skill set uh, has to be applied, okay? You have to have a solid management team. You have to help them become better, okay? Help them develop. Uh, perfect the core competencies of the company in solving the problem. That's key because that's what the industry needs. Company strategy and financial resources. That's the least problematic if you have the other three because the money follows. And of course, you have to support them in executing. That's what private equity does. Okay. The fourth thing here, and the last, is that you have to have, uh, in the industry, has to build conduits for institutional capital to come into the industry. That we hear from the government that there's these billions and all that from everybody, all the investors want to um, invest a lot of money in the industry because they recognize they need it and isn't it obvious, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, all that's obvious. What's not obvious is there is a gap, okay? There is a gap, and that is the, call it private equity, call it organization of capital, the people who actually organize institutional capital to come in and be deployed on proper, proper uh, rules and procedures so that there is a return, so that there's transparency, and all the things that institutions bring into to, to, to the picture, which in this industry is lacking enormously. So um, <clears throat> we need hundreds of billions, okay? Uh, 50 billion allocation is nothing, I can tell you that. Um, the, the conduits have to emerge. And the, the cheer fact is that we're just at the beginning of it. If you read the history of fixing the water industry in the, in the UK, they start, started in the Thatcher years, and it took them 40 years to, to fix it. And they have a national regulator. We don't. Okay? And the national regulator actually played a positive role in a way. Okay. Um, last page, and I know I've taken uh, a, long, a lot of time. Uh, analysis paralysis is what you typically see in the water sector. Uh, I would say that uh, we don't have that option. Uh, the problem is, is too important and, and has to be solved, okay? So in our case, we made that decision as a firm, and we started looking at it, and everybody likes to diagnose the problem. Uh, few people provide solutions, okay? Um, I can tell you that uh, I have spoken to about between 500 and 700 institutional investors, all wanted to take the meeting because they're all interested in water, None of them had any clue, and none of them have the courage, except the 10 or 20 that invested in our fund, to actually commit capital to it, okay? 
uh, nobody believed it could be done, okay? Uh, no one, because no one had done it before, and um, it was not possible because no one had done it before, so it's self-serving. And uh, we were not the water guys, I guess we are now the, the water guys. So because of all these reasons, okay, we have invited here today um, Josiah Cox, who is the CEO of CSWR. He is the other side of the solution because it's not enough to have conduits of capital. You actually have to have companies out there who are providing, pr providing a solution and doing it on a value-add basis. And um, with this, I introduce you. And the last cheery fact is, of course, that it can be done. So uh, that's the most cheery fact of all. That was good. So I hope, you know, when I get up here and talk, that kind of personalize both the water crisis that we're facing and personalize the solutions that are out there, right? It's kind of, so Central States Water Resources, I'm the founder and president. Our mission statement is to bring safe, reliable, and environmentally sustainable water resources to every community in the U.S. That every community piece is huge for us, right? Because there's, there's all these rural, ex-urban, ex-suburban communities out there. They're just languishing. They don't have the technical, managerial, and financial resources to deal with it. And that's really the market that we've targeted to come across the country. You know, personally, how I got into this business, I've been working on water wastewater space about 20 years. About 16 years ago, I experienced one of, I would call it hundreds of Jackson, Mississippi situations I've seen. There was a, a 3,000 person community. They had naturally occurring lead in the drinking water that was directly feeding a daycare. And they had a wastewater plant that was so failed that it called, caused eutrophication in the receiving water body. It was biologically dead. Even insects couldn't be there, right? And I was sitting there dealing with the regulators and I realized the regulatory burden on this small community was the same as if it was New York City. No difference, regulators couldn't bifurcate by size, anything like that. And I realized like, wow, there's gotta be a private solution to this really public problem. And that was really kind of the genesis of starting Central States Water Resources. So just give me my idea so I can echo uh, John's complaints and talk about the challenges of raising capital. So I created my trusty, dusty business plan back in 2011. I'm gonna consolidate all these water utilities. Obviously the problem's huge. It's been enumerated by multiple agencies. This should be an easy feat. Took me 90 different firms across the country to raise my first capital. It took me two years, right? I mean, it was a crazy journey. And I can't tell you how many people said, we don't believe it can be done, but as soon as you do it once, come back to us, right? I heard that over and over. Oh, it was just horrible, right? So in 2014, after I got my first round of investment, I bought my first water and wastewater systems, right? So give me an idea of my first water and wastewater system. First system I bought, the water, the water tank had rusted exhaust vents, so there's bird feces in the drinking water, which is a acute human health risk. It was on a 12-week boil order. The wastewater plant was surcharging untreated waste into a receiving stream. The attorney general had done an enforcement action against the wastewater plant. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would no longer do loans to this community. Working class community, $250,000, $350,000 homes, couldn't buy or sell a house in this community, right? It was that severe. And I've seen that level of severity over and over again. In that community, there was a moratorium on building. As soon as we took over the system, actually in the interim, we were going through the process, we saw, installed emergency um, uh, disinfection equipment, got them off the boil order, all that kind of good stuff. And immediately after we fixed the problem, they lifted the moratorium and this community has grown by 30%. So it was a huge success story. So here I am realizing that, hey, this, this problem's national, started in Missouri, and I met John Regis in 17. So I actually walked down the street to go see him here in New York. I was talking to other investors. Immediately found a kindred spirit and someone, hey, these guys have actually studied the water industry. They understand the issues, and they understand there's a, there is a private solution, and it can be done. So it was a great fit for us. Took us you know, over a year to get a deal to close, so that was great. And then when they closed with me, just to give you an idea of kind of the risk they took on us, we were just over 3,000 connections in two states, right? So at the end of 2022, we'll be the 12th largest and best room water and wastewater utility in the United States. So big growth plan because there's a ton of work to go do, right? So to give you an idea how sleepy the industry is and how much work there is to do, in 2021, there were 208 M&A transactions in water in the water business. We were, you know, 40-some percent of that entire you know, M&A, you know, selection across the entire country because there's so much to go do, and the, particularly in the small side, the mean and small transactions, and the big guys just don't focus on that, right? And that's oftentimes where the real problems are. You can see asset growth, connection growth over time, you know, into this year will be servicing probably like 700,000 people between 140,000 houses, right? One of the things that I hope you hear from me is this water crisis thing, it's not looming, it's here. This isn't like, 
oh yeah, the next broken thing's gonna happen. The broken stuff's already out there, right? So you're looking at a wastewater lagoon that we purchased. This lagoon uh, literally had not had any treatment in decades. It was just a cesspool. In fact, the customers had a certificated area with an economic regulator and had never paid a bill, right? And they had just languished because no one had been willing to go and step in and say, hey, there is a fix for this. You think there's 90,000 violations of either drinking water or wastewater uh, standards every year? That's more than one for every system in the, entire, you know, in the entire country. Obviously, they're concentrated in some acute offenders, but it is here. And the crisis is going on right now underneath our noses. You know, one of the things that I don't, it's hard to quantify, but when we, when we actively don't invest, it's negligent. Right? I mean, you heard Tom talk about you know, the lack of reinvestment, this you know, unfunded liability, all of that is circling around. And what we've seen, we have more and more stringent you know, regulation coming down the pipe, you know, PFOA, PFAS, more stringent nutrient you know, regulation in terms of wastewater. All that's coming, but if we're not enforcing against it, it doesn't matter, right? So if you don't have a guy actually getting a ticket from someone, why are they gonna make any you know, decision changes in terms of reinvestment, regardless of the risk they're taking? Right? That is a wastewater plant that we bought. That is a dead calf sitting in the disinfection chamber. So you can imagine how much disinfection is happening there. And you think about the, the, the levels of negligence that goes along with this. Like there's no security at the, the wastewater plant so a cow can just wander in. It's died and sat there for so long and no one's gone to check it. I mean, it is just layers and layers of you know, negligence really that is surrounding a ton of water and wastewater systems across the entire country. You know, the other thing is, you know, our existing standards don't breed confidence. That's a system we bought right there. That's manganese and lead in the water. So the EPA says from a primary standard standpoint, that is safe to drink. Would you drink that? You can't do laundry in that, right? So when we, when we have this lack of, you know, standards that are clear for the public and we have a lack of enforcement, you've got people who are un they don't trust us. They don't trust the water industry anymore. You know, we've talked about this quite a bit. You know, a family of four pays between, you know, 80 to $100 per month, that cost disproportionately, disproportionately falls in the disadvantaged communities. And we see that over and over again. So changing the economics means taking into account like how we build customer confidence. So here we go. This is, uh, this is our estimate. I love how you know, John said, no one can tell you how many water and wastewater utilities are in the United States. So we built a map, we tracked, we tracked every single water and wastewater plant in the United States. We think there's 85,000, but those include wastewater systems that are no discharge systems, you know, rapid infiltration basins, drip irrigation, all of that. But I mean, think about that. You know, we're talking 85,000, 86,000 water utilities. I mean, it is a staggering number, right? And that fragmentation is gonna to continue to result in Jackson, Mississippi's that are happening every day right now across the country, and they will continue to happen over and over again, right? So how do we fix that? Well, you know, for us, we, the way we've done it is we've had to get really local and very specific. It's a boots on the ground game, right? So when we go talk to a community, you can't talk on these overarching themes because, you know, all water and sewer is local, right? People care about their plant, their water system, their community, their homes, right? So that's how, how detailed you have to get. So oftentimes it's an education process, you know? If you're a rural community and you flush your, your toilet and it doesn't stay in your house, you think, Problem solved, it's over. And you don't realize the human health risks, potential community damages that are possible, your house values, all of that. You have no idea. There's been, no one's told you for years. So you, you're walking into a community explaining to them a crisis they don't know that exists. It's a quiet crisis, right? So there's a lot of explanation, a lot of education that has to go all the way down the community level. You know, when we think about um, uh, the policies that you have to do, you've got this intersection of multiple stakeholders. You've got your economic regulators, you've got your environmental regulators, your health regulators oftentimes are separate than your environmental regulators, right? Then you've got both the, the populace you're serving and their representatives, the politicians are involved, right? And oftentimes you'd be shocked. The economic regulators are not talking to the environmental regulators. They don't even know the mandates that are out there, right? So to bring all those stakeholders into a single room and communicate the issues that exist, and that they have to be fixed. And you know what, it's gonna cost something, right? It, you know, nothing's for free. And when you explain that intersection and you have everyone talking to each other, that's how we've been able to solve that, right? But that, again, is a ton of meetings, a ton of work, you can't mail that in, you can't send an email, you gotta get people in the room talking. And, and the, the last part is deploying patient, flexible capital. So, you know, imagine my private equity partner, I'm telling him, don't worry, in three years, you will get a return on your capital, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it takes someone who really understands the industry 
and is willing to take risk and be in it for the long term to really solve this. But when you take all that together, you specifically name the infrastructure, you get all the stakeholders together, and you have patient capital, then you can really solve some problems, right? And for us, and one of the reasons why I hate this anti-privatization thing, is our entire business model is really undergirded by the regulatory compact, right? So if you don't understand privatization, I'm gonna give you just a little lesson here, right? So as an investor-owned utility, we're, have, we are regulated economically by economic regulators, commissions, reg, regulated by the health department, and the environmental regulators, right? So as, a, as an investor-owned, every investment we make in infrastructure is audited, it's proved that it's actually the money's been spent, the infrastructure is in the ground, it's in use and useful, it's just and reasonable, so you can't gold plate. So there's a ton of structure around that whole thing just to prove that we've done the work to, to fix the problem, right? You know, beyond that, you know, the stakeholder part, this is a multi-pronged stakeholder engagement process. When you do rate increases or public processes, you're doing town hall meetings and mailings and, you know, multiple consumer interactions, you know, so there is a ton of transparency, transparency built to that whole thing. And the last part on the economic side, it's an audited third-party process. I mean, our financials are public record, right? How much more transparent can you get that? We're actually more transparent than a county or municipality, right? And I say all that because when you lay in the middle of that, you know, with this regulatory compact, that's when you're really able, from our perspective, on the private side, to kind of solve the crisis that we're seeing across the country. You know, the other thing that's interesting is solutions exist. I mean, you've heard of these technology CEOs. I mean, it's not a matter of can we fix it? It's a matter of can we engage with everyone enough that we actually put the solutions in place? That's the community we bought. That's the one that had the manganese and lead and the, uh, had the manganese and the iron in the drinking water. So we bought that system, I think 10 years, they couldn't do their laundry. Immediately, you know, they did a newspaper article the day after we closed. Oh, the residents are you know, super upset, which I get, because now there's a new person in town, and you've got years, a decade of frustration built up, right? And you finally think, if, if I raise my hand today, maybe something will change, right? So within six months, we're, built, we're building the solution, which is a filter system, which is not super technologically complicated, but it's just you had to put it in. And you know, our construction crews are on site, you've got residents bringing them beer and food, and like, oh my gosh, you're finally here. Like, it's just a radically different sentiment, right? And with a year, we totally transformed the community, right? So you think you go from water that you don't want to pay anything for to water that now you, you don't have to buy bottled water every day. I mean, the economic cost of the residents, you don't have to do laundry someplace else, have actually gone down, even though rates have gone way up, right? So that's a great example of how that whole thing works. You know, for us, we think the private sector has so much to bear in terms of efficiencies in deploying multiple systems simultaneously, right? We're not risk averse. You know, as a company, we've, we've actually internally developed a number of wastewater technologies. We piloted them, deployed them, and now we're using them at scale that we've, we made up ourselves, right? Just based on our experience of running a ton of small plants. But you think municipalities are not gonna take a risk on their own self-developed technology. They just don't, you know, the, the bureaucratic win in that is zero, right? And you just gotta remember, the public sector, you have nothing but negative you know, incentives. You're either going to pass something and it works and you get no bonus at the end of the year, or you pass something that doesn't work and you lose your job, right? And the private sector doesn't work like that. There is, there is a tolerance to be able to apply different, you know, different industry and technology simultaneously. So we're doing great stuff. You know, you think basic stuff like tying GIS maps to asset management programs, meters that are dynamic, we're using real time you know, RTUs to tell us what's happening in terms of pump run times and where we're gonna do targeted reinvestment and how do we efficiently deploy our capital. I mean, that's the secret sauce that the private sector has, is able to bear that we're doing real time and that's what's really allowed us to consolidate these, these utilities. They're geographically disparate, they're all over place, we're in 10 states, soon to be 12 states with multiple different regulatory frameworks. But when you tie the data together with the actual physical infrastructure, you're able to run all that simultaneously, right? So it's been a huge win and super fun. And you know, we talked about our impact today. So there we go, there's a cool map. This is gonna be 800 something plants by the end of this year. So I'm pr uh, we're pretty sure that we'll be the single largest owner operator of individual, not the most customers, but individual wastewater plants in the United States by the end of this year, right? So with all that, it's great. Number one in the United States, well, 800. There's 85,000. We're 1%, right, of the whole issue. And we're, you know, we're trying to make a, 
make a great run at it in this country to really change the, the face of the water and wastewater infrastructure, but there's a lot more people that need to get involved, right? I mean, we, we wanna be the biggest poop provider for small communities in the United States, right? And that is just gonna be a small chunk of what's really needed to get done, right? So it's exciting times and it is possible. And you know what? When it's this bad, you know, I mean, you, you can't imagine the things we've seen over and over again. I mean, just completely failed mechanical plants, systems that haven't been touched for decades, systems that we in roads to. People don't even know where the plant was. I mean, crazy stuff. It's getting fixed, right? So having the technological solutions you're building, that's not the hard part. I mean, look at that. Literally a cesspool. I mean, that thing, it sat there with residents under EPA violations for 20 years and nothing happened there in the corner, right? You know, mechanical plants completely overgrown, no treatment happening. And you know, we're, we're able to use the existing structures, right, and rehab that and put in new technology and make it work, right? So the solutions exist, no matter how bad it is, we can turn it around. So there we go. With that, I'm going to give it to Tom and talk about the call. Yeah, so that's, uh, th that's all we really had. But I think the, the key takeaway is that we can look at Jackson, Mississippi and feel bad for them or maybe make fun of them or say, that's not me. But the United States really has to wake up and say, Jackson, Mississippi is the canary in the mine. Jackson is telling us what's coming for all of us, right, unless we attack this. And as Josiah had pointed out, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but we have to be able to look at the problem as a three-dimensional problem. It's not just pipes and, and infrastructure. It's also the economics of water. It's public policy. And we have to get our arms wrapped around this this cycling deferred maintenance beast, right? Because at some level, it truly is too big to fix, but only if we don't use our imagination and only if we ignore it. If we keep ignoring the too big, uh, too big to fix concept, we're just gonna keep putting Band-Aids on it. So thanks for your attention tonight, but hopefully you've learned a little bit that Jackson is an unfortunate situation, but something that can be fixed as long as we see it as a truly American problem and not something isolated in a state where we don't live. So thank you. Mm -hmm.